Good morning. The scripture reading for today is Matthew 13, 1 through 9 and 18 to 23. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is one who produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. This is God's word. It was C.S. Lewis who once said, human history is the long, terrible story of man trying to find something other than God which will make him happy. It's the long, terrible story of human beings trying to find something other than God which will make them happy. That's the story of the scriptures from beginning to end. It's one of the reasons our vision here is what it is. Our vision is captivating generations, generations, many generations, with the satisfying gospel of Jesus Christ. Because it's only the gospel that satisfies and uh, we have a number of values here that we hold to, five values. One of those uh, values is this. It's gospel community. The church is a taste of heaven. These values are what we believe we need to embody in the life of our church if we're going to get traction in accomplishing our vision. The church is a taste of heaven. It's a harbinger of the new heavens and the new earth. And by church, I don't mean Alliance Bible Church alone, but the global body of true believers in Christ is meant to give people a taste of heaven. It's meant to be a foretaste of heaven. Now, why is that? Well, when Jesus arrived on the scene, he announced that the kingdom of God was at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand, he said. So Jesus' arrival inaugurated the kingdom. The kingdom is both already and not yet. It has been inaugurated, Matthew 3, 4, 10, etc., but it is also not yet. It has not yet been consummated, Matthew 26, Luke 19, and others. So there's a sense in which God's kingdom is here, and the domain of God's redemptive rule is the church. The domain of God's redemptive rule is the church. The church is the sphere, the domain, the territory wherein God rules. Now, we, uh, there's a lot the New Testament has to say about the kingdom, but we're going to look at this passage today, which I think ought to be one of the very first, if not the first, place to look when we think about the kingdom of God. 
We're gonna look at two points this morning from this teaching of Jesus's. We're gonna look at how the kingdom comes, how the kingdom comes in signs it's penetrated your heart because sometimes we think about the kingdom as something we enter into, but this teaching is telling us explicitly the kingdom is something that enters into us. And when the kingdom enters into us, God's domain of his redemptive rule spreads. So we're gonna look at how the kingdom comes and signs it's penetrated your heart. First, how it comes. Now when you hear the word kingdom today, this is probably not a biblical understanding of uh, the, uh, the, the kingdom in the, in the scriptures. This is not Arendelle, there is no Elsa. You will not find Anna here, or Anna. Uh, this is not a theme park in Florida or California or the other places around the world. This is not at all like the kingdoms portrayed on popular cable TV shows. There is a massive difference between the kingdom of God and earthly kingdoms. And when I think about an earthly kingdom, I think about things like a geopolitical nation. Uh, it could be a business. It could be a movement of some kind, an earthly kingdom. Uh, there's a massive difference between the two. Earthly kingdoms, earthly kingdoms, almost always come through varying degrees of coercion and force. They almost always come through varying degrees of coercion and force. They never come through hearing. Earthly leaders are almost always great at getting a hearing. They're almost always great at getting a hearing, but the kingdom of God comes to those who are great at giving a hearing. The kingdom of God, Jesus is saying, comes through hearing. It comes by hearing the word, listening well, listening deeply, listening and understanding. It's, that's actually the primary skill of the kingdom of God. Now, if we look at most leaders in the world today, they're almost always great at getting a hearing. They're great at sound bites. They're great at lobbying, picketing, getting the message out, advertising. They're great at coming into a room, uh, into a meeting, and getting people to do what they want. But the best leaders of earthly kingdoms are often very bad listeners. See, every other kingdom moves forward on the basis of varying degrees of coercion and force. But the kingdom of God comes forward, moves forward through listening. Goes through, advances by listening. Now Jesus goes to great lengths throughout the gospels to show us the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is like a seed. A seed. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is like a seed. Here in Matthew 13, the word kingdom is like a seed in verse 18, verse 24, verse 31, verse 38. The kingdom of God is like a seed. So again, the kingdom isn't just something believers enter into. The kingdom of God is something that enters into human beings. Now, in this parable, the seed is the message about the kingdom. So the seed is teaching. It's a message. It's a word about the kingdom. It's the scripture. The kingdom of God moves forward on the basis of hearing that message, hearing that truth. Now, contrast that with human kingdoms, earthly kingdoms. They almost always move forward on the basis of coercion and force. When Alexander the Great brought his kingdom to a town, everybody knew it was there. Everybody knew it was there because there were only two kinds of people left in the town when Alexander brought his kingdom to it. Only two kinds of people. There were people who were in his kingdom and people who were dead. You died fighting his kingdom or you were in his kingdom. It moved forward on the basis of coercion and force. Even laws in a democratic republic like ours work this way. Laws work on the basis of varying degrees of coercion and force. And what I mean by that is what people ought to do and what people want to do are often not the same thing. Which means in order to get them to do what they ought to do, there needs to be something external to them that forces them to do so. Every week, you live under a set of laws that you must obey. Speed limits, parking restrictions, one-way streets, I realize that for some of you, some of those things are more reverent than others, but 
And if you don't like it, if you don't like it, the system has built within it consequences. What people ought to do and what people want to do are often not the same thing. And if you don't believe me about that, just do a thought experiment on paying taxes. Enough said. The kingdom of God is different. It does not move forward on the basis of coercion and force. I heard a pastor once contrast this. He was contrasting the kingdom of God with earthly kingdoms uh, by using the imagery of a seed and a boulder. As Jesus says, the kingdom of God is like a seed. It's not a boulder. When When a boulder comes and hits the ground, it smashes the ground in such a way that you see it and you hear it. There's no mistaking it. But the seed comes in very quietly and unnoticeable. The boulder transforms and revolutionizes the ground externally. The seed revolutionizes the ground internally. The boulder comes in and does it suddenly and coercively. The seed comes in and does it organically, gradually, and gently. The boulder actually just breaks the land. (laughs) But the seed transforms the soil into a garden or a forest. It transforms the soil by reorienting and rechanneling its energies and nutrients and minerals into life-giving processes. The boulder ultimately doesn't really change the land. It just breaks it with, with sheer external power. The seed ultimately transforms it completely. It's not superficial the way the boulder does it. So in the same way, human kingdoms, whether it's an Alexander the Great bloody kingdom or a democratic process, only superficially can affect you. It's done through varying degrees of coercion and force. But the kingdom of God comes by getting the truth and having it penetrate the heart. Now that is not exciting for most of us. It's not exciting for most of us. Think of... Think of Picture this for a minute. Think about the last time you planted a seed in a pot. Tiny little seed in a pot. How dramatic of an experience was that for you? You green thumbs, which I know you're the most excited among us about this. Uh, How powerful an experience was it when you put that tiny little seed in the soil? Was it the highlight of your week? After you finished, did you go next door to your neighbor, knock on the door, and share with them the excitement over the experience you just had? Did you say, you'll never guess what the highlight of my week was. I put a seed in some dirt. That was the highlight of my week. You couldn't stop talking about it. You threw a party over it. Huh? Probably not. Because the experiences that are most likely to get our attention are bolder experiences. The experiences we're most likely to go next door and knock on our neighbor's door and tell them about are bolder experiences, not seed experiences. The the experiences we're most likely to get excited about are bolder experiences. They're not seed experiences. You understand what I'm getting at here? The kingdom of God is like a seed. When When you put a seed in some dirt... At first, it looks vulnerable and weak, and I tell you what else it looks like. It looks completely underwhelming. When you put a seed in some dirt, it looks weak, vulnerable, completely underwhelming. That's how the kingdom of God comes. The kingdom of God starts with a crazy message. The the kingdom of God starts with something that looks weak and strange, and people will look at it, and here's what they'll think. They'll look at it and they'll say, there is no way that's going to change a life. They're going to look at it and they're going to say, there is no way that is going to change the world. No way. That's why, by the way, (laughs) seed scattering is often abandoned for picketing. That's why seed ministry is often abandoned for bolder ministry. The kingdom starts with a seed, the weakest, tiniest little thing that enters and at first doesn't seem to make a difference at all. But when the seed gets in, it eventually changes the entire landscape. A boulder cannot change the landscape the way a seed can. 
See, when Alexander the Great brought his kingdom to a town, everybody knew it. You got your tax assessment. You paid your tribute. There was no missing it. But Jesus is saying the kingdom of God can be missed. Quite easily, in fact. It's easy to reject. It's very subtle. You have to listen, really listen. You have to reflect. You have to think. You have to take it in. And as a result, there are many people who think they're in the kingdom, but they're not really. There are many people who think, Jesus says, there are many people who think that they've really heard me, but they have not heard me. This is how the kingdom comes. Second, signs has penetrated your heart. There are four of them that I'll bring your attention to in this parable. First sign the kingdom has penetrated your heart is understanding. Now, all four soils hear the word. All four types of people hear the word, but only one combines hearing with understanding, and that's the good soil. Only the good soil combines hearing with understanding. One sign the kingdom has entered you or the life of another, one sign the seed has penetrated your heart is understanding. Now, don't check out from this moment on and think you've got understanding figured out. You don't. This word for understanding is very interesting. In other contexts, it can mean to bring together enemy combatants. Two parties hostile toward one another are brought together, not for war, but for discussion, to hash things out. So in the context of Jesus' words, it means the message of the kingdom of God, the truth of the kingdom, and our natural minds are at odds with one another. The message of God's kingdom and what we naturally believe are hostile toward one another. Our minds, your mind, and the mind of God are not natural allies. We are born in conflict with God. We don't naturally see things God's way. Our minds and the message of God's kingdom are enemy combatants. The kingdom will not enter a life that simply dismisses the message of the Bible. The kingdom enters the lives of those who stay engaged, who stay at the table. Let me give you an example of this. Time and again in ministry, I have heard statements like, well, I just can't believe in a God that would allow that. I can't believe in a God who believes this or that. I just can't believe God would ever... You fill in the blank. In other words, the moment God says something or does something I disagree with, I leave the conversation. That's it. I don't agree with that. I'm out of here, God. That's a sign the kingdom has not penetrated the heart. But one of the signs the kingdom has entered you, because that's the imagery Jesus is using. He's saying the kingdom isn't just something we enter into. The kingdom is something that enters us. One of the signs the kingdom has entered you one of the signs the kingdom has penetrated your heart is that when God tells you something you don't agree with, you stay engaged. You stay engaged. And not to fight him, not to fight him, but to work hard to think like he does. That's understanding. When you encounter God's kingdom truths that you don't like, you don't dismiss them, you stay engaged, not to fight him, but to learn to think like he does. You stay engaged in order to see your mind conformed to God's. That's the first sign the kingdom has penetrated your heart. Second sign the kingdom has penetrated your heart is perseverance. This one's unsettling. Jesus tells us that the rocky soil and the thorny soil have something in common. Seeds that land there initially grow. Initially, there are signs of life. The rocky and thorny soils represent people who initially respond positively to the message of the kingdom. They're receptive to it. And they demonstrate, perhaps, receptivity through continued engagement with the church and personal spiritual disciplines. They show an emotional excitement over the things of God. They can talk about matters of spirituality. But in both cases, after a period of time, and we're not told how long, it could be weeks, months, years, after a period of time, the plant growing in those two soils dies. 
In both cases, these people eventually prove the message of the kingdom has not fully penetrated their hearts. Why? Because they fail to endure. They fail to persevere. Why? I think there are a number of reasons for that, but I I do wonder sometimes how many people are having powerful religious experiences, but those powerful religious experiences are the product of a boulder crashing on top of their lives, not a seed entering it. The New Testament writers understood, I think, the power of an emotional religious experience and its ability to deceive. They understood it. They understood it when they started talking about things like Paul did in Colossians 1. Look at this verse. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Watch this. If, if you continue in your faith, it's conditional. Established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. They understood the deceptive nature of powerful emotional religious experience. That fades. The product of a seed entering a life continues to the end. Here's another one in Hebrews 3. We have come to share in Christ if, if, if. Indeed, we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. This particular sign is unsettling. And I'll tell you why. It's very unsettling for Americans like us. You know why? (laughs) It does not yield quick results. It does not yield quick results. It takes a lifetime. Third sign, the kingdom has penetrated your heart is fruit production. Some 100, some 60, some 30 times what was sown. Fruit in the Bible is often a metaphor for righteousness. The Apostle Paul used the imagery of fruit to talk about things like love and joy, patience, self-control. Fruit production, or to put it differently, A life that changes, a life that changes is evidence the kingdom has penetrated your heart. So how do I know if I'm producing fruit? Let me give you some diagnostic questions. Let me give you some diagnostic questions. How do I know if I'm I'm producing fruit? First, do I have a desire to study the Bible? Do I have a desire to and am I acting on that desire? Start there as a diagnostic question. What is your appetite for the word? How would you rate it on a 10 scale? Your desire, your passion, your interest in the scriptures. Keep in mind the Bible's no ordinary book. It's more than a book, much more than a book. It's a perfectly aligned extension of God himself. So our treatment of the scriptures is tantamount to our treatment of God himself. By the way, when I, see this, when I say the scriptures, I'm not talking about the leather or the paper or the ink or the binding. Okay, that's not what I'm talking about. Okay, I'm not talking about your physical treatment of the thing because the word of God transcends the medium through which it's given. If you could somehow round up every hard copy, every electronic copy of the Bible on the planet and destroy it, would God's word still exist? Yes, because God's word transcends the medium through which it's given. That's the thing I'm talking about. Your treatment of that is tantamount to your treatment of God himself. So if the words in this book are muted in your life, you're telling me you prefer that God keep his mouth closed. Or if we're reading books about the Bible more than we're reading the Bible, we're demonstrating we're actually more interested in what human beings are saying about God than what God's saying about himself. So that's the first diagnostic question. Am I producing fruit? Do I have a desire to study the Bible? Am I acting on that desire? Second, am I getting less upset or anxious during difficult times? Am I getting less upset, less anxious during difficult times because 
because my trust in God's plan for my life is growing. Do you see progress there? Here's another one. Have the people in my life who know me best, and these are the folks you have to ask, the people in your life who know you best, have they seen a change in my character? So would they say, the people in your life who know you best, would they say you are becoming more humble, gentle, patient than you used to be? Do the people in your life who know you best say that? That's signs of fruit production. A couple more. Am I getting jealous less? Am I lusting less? Am I getting angry less? Am I getting more generous with the money and the time that God has given to me? Am I getting more generous with the money and the time that God has given me? Now listen, bearing fruit does not mean perfection. It does mean progress. It doesn't mean perfection. It means progress. And when you're measuring this in your life or you're attempting to take a look at this in your life, you need to chart it like you did your kids' growth charts on the walls of your home. Okay? What I mean by that is when your kid came up to you two days after you last measured him and said, am I taller? You said what? It's been two days. Let's give it a while. Six months, a year, something like that. That's the span of time you need to use when you're measuring fruit production. Don't say to yourself, you know, am I, am I more gentle than I was last week? Uh, how about last year or five years ago, 10 years ago? Am I more generous with my time and my money than I was 10 years ago? That's the right question. Last sign, the kingdom has penetrated your heart is a focused heart. This may be the one that is, uh, we are most uh, susceptible to, lacking this part of it. When Jesus is explaining what he means by soil with thorns in it, here's what he says. Let me show you the verse again. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world we got a Bible circle that phrase, the cares of the world. The cares of the world. The deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. So this is the person who hears the word and believes it and wants to follow it, but the cares of the world prevent the seed of the kingdom from taking root. In other words, there are other things in life that end up feeling more important. It may never be conscious, in fact. The word of God just gets pushed to the side. So listen, you're fascinated when you come to church. You're fascinated, you're engaged, but as soon as you get out there, you've got bills to pay and you've got money to make. So the message of the kingdom takes a back seat. You like being in church and hearing the word of God, but your kid has sports on Sunday morning, so you just can't be here all that much. The cares of the world push the kingdom aside. Or you've got that new lake house. You just love your time there. You love your weekends there. God wants us to enjoy nature, right? So you go there rather than devoting yourself to sitting under the ministry of the word here. For many high school students here, you're listening to this and you're saying, yes, this is important. But the moment you leave here, you're gonna be on your phones getting consumed with whatever's going on with Snapchat and TikTok. Look, they're not bad things. They're not bad things. But the cares of this world choke out the word. Many of you aren't gonna follow through on obedience to God's word because of the cares of this world. You're not gonna do what's right because you think your friends are gonna think you're weird. You're not going to get involved in mission or ministry because there's too much other stuff to do. You're not going to obey God with the first fruits in your tithes because there's so much stuff you want but can't afford. It's never a conscious decision. 
to reject God. This is the way the enemy often works. He puts up stuff in front of our eyes that's pleasing to them and lures us aside. It's never a conscious decision to reject God. It's just that God's word gets crowded out by other good things. J.D. Greer put it boldly. He said, distraction sends more people to hell than doubt or defiant disobedience. Do you have a focused heart? A focused heart? Focused heart is a sign the kingdom has penetrated your heart. Why? Well, remember, unlike a boulder, a seed possesses the internal power to shape an entire landscape. Have you seen the landscape of your life transformed? Do you see evidence in your life that what you've been shaped by is not a boulder, but a seed? As we close, I want to relate these four signs to our church as a whole community because I want us to try to get a picture for what this would look like. If the kingdom of God is the domain of his redemptive rule and the church is the primary place where that happens, these things should be true of us. So when the seed of the kingdom has penetrated the hearts of a community of people, you're going to see people vigorously pursuing the mind of God. You're going to see people who want to know what God says about everything he says anything about. You'll see people who want to have their minds conformed to that of God so they start thinking like he does. When the seed of the kingdom has penetrated the hearts of a community of people, you're going to see people concerned for their own perseverance to the very end of the race. Not just thinking about this week. But where am I going to be with Christ one year from now, five years from now? You're going to see a community of people who are actually concerned for the perseverance of others. Hey, I see you wandering off here. Let's get back on track. Get your eyes fixed on Jesus. That's the finish line. When the seed of the kingdom has penetrated the hearts of a community of people, you're going to see people producing the fruit of righteousness. So we're going to see people becoming more gentle, humble, Patient, joyful. You'll see people less angry, less lustful. When the seed of the kingdom has penetrated the hearts of a community of people, you're going to see people with focused hearts, not wanting the cares of this world to distract them. You'll see people less vulnerable to diversion. Less vulnerable to having their Sunday mornings diverted elsewhere. Less vulnerable to having their money diverted elsewhere. Less vulnerable to having their best energy, best attention diverted elsewhere. If you can picture a community of people like this, then you can see why it is the church is meant to be a taste of heaven. Can you picture it? Let's pray. I just want to give you a minute here. Jesus' teachings are often very hard to swallow. He's gentle, but he's a straight shooter. And he gives us some things that are very difficult, very difficult, not to understand cognitively, but difficult to chew on and to see become part of who we are. What do you need to confess to him? What do you need to, what do you need to ask him help for? Maybe your appetite for his word has grown stale. One of the best things you can pray for is to ask him for help 
in that area. You seeing change in your life? You more patient than you were a year ago? You more joy filled than you were five years ago? Jesus, we pray the seed of the kingdom would penetrate our hearts afresh. I pray we would be a church known for giving a great hearing to the message of the kingdom. A great hearing. I pray we would be a church that's faithful in scattering seed. Give us the faith needed to know seed scattering is the primary engine of kingdom growth. And Jesus, it's my personal desire to be fruitful. Help me grow in love, joy, humility, and self-control. Jesus, I pray for the hearts that have been diverted, where the cares of the world seem to be winning out. Pray that you'd shake us. If our contentment has been tied to earthly things, I pray that you would shake that. That we would anchor our satisfaction to knowing you. And through all this, Jesus, I pray that you would help us become a community that offers a foretaste of heaven. We ask these things for your glory and honor and praise, and we ask these things for our good. Amen.